Hi, everyone. As we wait for people to join in, I'll note that we are recording this session today, and we'll start in just a few minutes. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. I am Diana Dragaris, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the National Zoning Atlas. We are happy you joined us today for our Hawaii State Zoning Atlas reveal. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with our work, the National Zoning Atlas is a collaborative of researchers digitizing, demystifying, and democratizing U.S. zoning codes. We are housed within the Legal Constructs Lab at Cornell University's College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. And we work under the direction of founder and director, Sarah Bronin, who developed our novel, our novel methodology that explains how to gather data about local zoning laws and funnel that data into a standardized online map. Uh, our research collaborative is comprised of over two dozen teams across the country, as well as a central team of analysts based out of Cornell, who use this methodology to create zoning atlases for their respective regions or states. We are united by the belief that zoning codes have a tremendous impact on our built and natural environments, economy, and social fabric. But zoning codes as they exist today are overcomplicated and antiquated and create a black box that precludes most people from really understanding the legal constraints that shape how buildings are built and how land is used. Uh, we believe a demystification of zoning will prepare all stakeholders, everyone from policymakers to planning professionals to regular people, to answer questions like, why is there so much traffic? How flood resilient is my community? And of course, the age old question of why is housing so expensive and why isn't there enough of it? Uh, I encourage you to check out our website at zoningalice.org and to follow our social media platforms. Um, on another note, uh, this week is also a special one for the NZA because this Friday at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern, we are hosting an event to launch our interactive map and to be clear, that's the data exploration tool that we've developed that integrates um, all of our state, state team atlases um, into one uh, cohesive national map. Uh, we invite everyone uh, to attend and you can register at zoningatlas.org uh, slash events. So for today, we are very excited to shine, shine the spotlight on a Hawaii zoning atlas uh, released in August of this year. Uh, Hawaii is the fourth ever statewide zoning atlas to be completed using the NZA methodology. Uh, representing the team today is Trey Gordner, director, director of the Hawaii Zoning Atlas, and Sterling Higa, executive director of uh, Housing Hawaii's Future. So before I pass uh, the presentation over to them um, to introduce themselves a bit more, I want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we'll all can reconvene at the end uh, for a Q&A. So with that, I will pass it off to Trey. Thank you, Diana. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Trey Gordner, a brief introduction. I am by day a technology fellow with the federal government, uh, but I'm doing this work in my personal capacity, nights and weekends and whatnot. I am trained as an urban planner originally. I'm a lecturer at UH Manoa on housing policy, and I serve on my local neighborhood board in Eva Beach, where I live uh, with my wife and one-year-old son. I'll pass it off to Sterling for his introduction. Hey, my name is Sterling Higa. I serve as Executive Director of Housing Hawaii's Future, a nonprofit movement creating opportunities for the next generation by 
ending the workforce housing shortage in Hawaii. Super excited to be here. Thanks, Sterling. With that, I will share my screen and we'll get started. All right. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I have this quote up here because I hope that everyone who's on the call today learns something that they didn't know before, resolves to take action in a way that, that they didn't think about before, and uh, tell someone else about what you learned today. But before we get too serious with the matter of changing ourselves in order to change our, our housing reality, uh, I thought I would share a couple of pictures of who I am outside of work, just mainly dad to this little guy. This is Winston. He was born at Queens on, uh, in October of 2022. And while kids in Hawaii are expensive, as, uh, as Sterling could tell you as well, due in no small part to housing. So uh, I know that people have a general sense of housing being a problem out here, but I thought it'd be helpful to start just by highlighting some of the precise challenges related to housing in Hawaii. And these come from a, a report of the state legislature in response to the, the Maui wildfires. So we have the highest rental costs in the nation, we have the highest single family homeowner costs in the nation. Uh, we have twice the national rate of homelessness. Uh, our housing costs are exploding, uh, not just we were already way ahead and now they're, they're up even higher. And uh, we are facing uh, seven consecutive years of population loss. And I just saw a projection in the paper that out-migration is expected to be up another 30% this year. So how has it gotten this bad? Well, in Hawaii, we're of two minds about housing. We support it in theory and oppose it in practice. And it's important to note that these dynamics are not unique to Hawaii. They're common across the country, but they are particularly severe here. So I'm not one to bury the lead. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what I plan to tell you uh, in in three sentences. The housing crisis is a policy choice. It is one we keep making over and over again, year over year, uh, and one that we need to stop making uh, in order to make a difference. Specifically, there's one aspect of uh, housing and land use policy that tends to be a little, uh, a little confusing, a little wonky, uh, goes unnoticed, and that is zoning. And uh, zoning, as we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, excludes by design. It's intended to separate things. And uh, what it leads to in practice is state-sponsored segregation by economic class. You cannot live in a certain area unless you are of a certain means, period. And so once we walk through uh, some of the, you know, the case for, for what I'm saying today, I hope that everyone on this call will recognize that they have a moral responsibility to propose and support reform, including uh, some reforms that are being considered in the state legislature this year. The, the cycle is about to start. And Sterling will talk about some of those in his part. So first, what do I mean by exclusion by design? Well, I have three pictures here that I pulled. They're advertisements of uh, housing units uh, for rent or for sale in Hawaii. And uh, the one on the left is, uh, is a mansion, right? It's a, it's a beachfront estate. The one in the middle is um, what housing nerds would call a fourplex. There are four units in a single building. And uh, on the right, we have uh, a mid-rise apartment complex. So uh, zoning uh, is the laws on the books that say what kind of housing can go where, what kind of buildings can go where, what they can be used for. And uh, the current rules favor the construction of fewer, larger, more expensive dwelling units, and above all, uh, the large single family home on a large lot. And so the point I want you to take away here is that in Hawaii, these three pictures, they go easy, hard, hard. It is very easy to build uh, that, that beachfront estate. It is very hard, relatively speaking, to build that fourplex in the middle or to build those apartments on the right. And it's no surprise 
uh, in that case, that we have a glut of mansions um, that appeal to people who only intend to uh, you know, fly in and out of Hawaii from other parts of the country and, uh, and around the world, and that we have a severe shortage of uh, the homes that locals need. So uh, you may, being an optimist, think that this is a historical accident, that this is an unintentional effect of our housing policy. Uh, but in fact, uh, this, these laws are working as intended. Uh, this analysis comes from a book. If you're interested in these topics, I recommend you pick up Color of Law, Forgotten History of How Government Segregated America. And in this book, um, Richard Rothstein talks about the court cases that led to zoning being seen as a, as a legal power that um, state and, and local governments could execute. And the initial um, reasons given for zoning were issues around housing being too close to factories, adult entertainment being too close to schools, those sorts of things. Um, but you know, the cases in which those occurred were fairly limited uh, and, and most present in our largest cities. And yet, shortly after this court case, Euclid v. Ambler, uh, zoning was rapidly adopted across the entire country. And so why uh, was this um, legal tool that was supposed to separate uses uh, so readily adopted in so many parts of the country that didn't seem to need it? Uh, well, the truth was that in many cases, uh, race-based and class-based segregation was the intent. The courts bought this story that, you know, this was about health and welfare. Uh, and tragically, the decisions that were made at this time are still the basis of our zoning law today across this country. And this is a direct quote from the, uh, from the Supreme Court decision made on this, saying that uh, apartment houses are parasites uh, on, on neighborhoods, and it is right to, uh, to separate them, to prevent them from being side by side. So uh, not only is this working as intended, it's not just a historical legacy that we've inherited. Uh, it's something that's still being reinforced today. So here's another book, Neighborhood Defenders. Uh, this is, in my opinion, the best study of this phenomenon. But uh, Catherine Einstein and her fellow researchers studied the participants in zoning hearings. Uh, in, in, she started in her home state of Massachusetts and has since branched out. What she's found is that uh, the people who speak up at hearings, in other words, who are informing the decisions that, that cities and, and counties are making around what gets to be built where, are disproportionately older white homeowners opposed to development. And they've studied this compared to census data, comparing the people who are present with, um, with, this, with the demographics of the city or county at large, and also uh, compared it to ballot referendum votes, uh, where people were voting in state elections in favor of having more affordable housing in their uh, in their cities, and yet uh, clamping down uh, people coming out and opposing it in practice. So the authors conclude, ironically, that zoning outcomes uh, would be more equitable with less public participation because uh, the the process is so biased at this point. So. The last component is even though public opinion has not caught up, um, planners have acknowledged, urban planners have acknowledged that um, single family zoning uh, was in many cases a mistake. Uh, that, and they have proposed in this new equity and zoning policy guide from the American Planning Association, the professional organization uniting uh, planners across the country, uh, they've recommended many changes, um, quite significant changes to the way that we uh, zone today, including allowing more types of housing by right, that is allowing uh, duplexes, triplexes, and, uh, and potentially even uh, small uh, apartment complexes in more areas in, in these towns and cities um, to enable mixed use communities to go back to a time when uh, shops were next to homes, were next to offices, uh, to reduce minimum lot sizes, and, uh, and make some other changes here, including parking, ADUs, and manufactured homes. And uh, a couple of these recommendations are up for consideration in, uh, in the state legislature this cycle. And also, uh, there are some uh, changes being considered at the, at the county level, and Sterling will at least speak to the state ones. So uh, with that brief crash course on zoning, 
uh, you can see why it's important to understand what laws that we have on the books and how they might affect housing supply and affordability in Hawaii. And that is what the Hawaii Zoning Atlas is for. So uh, Hawaii Zoning Atlas, you can see it for yourself uh, at hawaiizoningatlas.com. I'll provide a demonstration in just a moment for everyone on. And really, the Zoning Atlas is three things. It's an online interactive map allowing to you to explore how the laws treat housing uh, across the state. It is an original data set which allows researchers to compare the laws that we have in Hawaii um, between the counties and also with other jurisdictions across the country uh, and potentially to compare how the laws have changed uh, within, our, within our jurisdictions over time. And finally, uh, as Diana noted at the beginning, uh, we are a National Zoning Atlas affiliate. We are a part of a larger uh, project, a larger movement to understand zoning and its effects across the country. So why it's needed, the stakes are high and it's not just about equity, although that's uh, the point that I wanna highlight today. Um, there are other things that matter uh, for Hawaii too. Zoning has been, uh, large lot single family zoning has been connected to uh, environmental degradation uh, because it, by preventing uh, neighborhoods in uh, near the city center to, to grow up, it causes the city to extend outwards. You can think of this as like pushing on a balloon uh, after it's it's blown up, right? The, the air expands to the to the margins, and um, that is a, a key source of the pressure to convert uh, agricultural land, conservation land uh, here in Hawaii, because uh, in a legal framework in which it's much easier to build a single family suburban home, that is what you were going to get at the margins. Uh, there are also economic impacts, housing costs are the most obvious ones, uh, but many of our labor shortages in Hawaii also stem from our housing costs. If you read Civil Beat, if you read the newspaper, or you watch the news, uh, you know that we're always talking about a labor shortage uh, related to you know, uh, teachers or, or government employees, public servants, nurses, doctors. Uh, and, and that's because when we have a system that um, makes it so that housing costs increase faster than inflation, wages will never keep up, right? And, and so there's this uh, major negative economic impact um, as well. And then finally, uh, for equity, where you live determines uh, where you can work and where you can go to school. And so uh, if regulations uh, prevent people from living in certain places, then what they're actually doing in effect uh, by excluding low-income families from the best neighborhoods is excluding them um, from the best jobs and the best schools that they can attend. And you know, we've traced many more other issues, but I'll leave you with these three for today. So how we built the Atlas, uh, the Hawaii Zoning Atlas was built as a coalition of uh, local nonprofits with national advice and funding. So uh, Faith Action for Community Equity and, and Code with Aloha are the two main partners uh, locally who, who helped us to do this. And then uh, National Zoning Atlas and the Mercatus Center provided guidance and in, in Mercatus's case, provided some funding uh, to help us make this possible. So in essence, um, we read all of the land use ordinances across the state uh, for, uh, for context in Honolulu alone, that is 436 pages of PDF uh, legalese to work through. Uh, we extracted key aspects of the laws uh, to understand how they treated housing in different places and entered those into a spreadsheet following the methodology that, that Diana described at the beginning of the call, which is the same methodology that all of the zoning atlases across the country are using. Um, I wanna highlight something in, in particular that I think makes the Hawaii Zoning Atlas special. As far as I know, we are the only team in the country comprised mainly of volunteers. So uh, I wanna thank by name a couple of people, Devin, James, and Christian, who are our uh, zoning interns, Tyler, Mike, and Kurt of Code with Aloha, and John D. and Ashley of Faith Action, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. So with that, uh, I will switch over to a demonstration. And uh, like I said, this is live now, hawaiizoningatlas.com. I'm just going to highlight um, 
one uh, standout observation from Maui today. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, you can you can look at the state data as a whole. You can look at Honolulu, look at Big Island, why? Uh, so you'll see that at, in this view, we have an interactive map of uh, of Maui Island, right? And uh, right now we have the entire uh, island highlighted. So so we're seeing all of the land. If I come in and I check this box showing permitted residential uses for one family housing, uh, you'll see that at first glance, there appears to be quite a lot of um, land available to single family homes. Now, I'll make one note about that, which is if you know anything about Maui, you know that that's not completely true uh, because these, these large interim zones uh, are in fact the, the sides of mountains, right? <laughs> this is a mountain range and this is a, a, a crater. Uh, so as you, you know, play around, you can start to match up other aspects like, um, like federal land, state land, land ownership to understand how likely uh, particular areas are to be developed, even if uh, to become housing, uh, even if in theory the law would allow it. So one family housing um, with the caveat of the mountains, uh, you know, over a third of the land is legally available for housing uh, for single family homes, right? What we were talking about at the beginning. Let's switch that over to four plus family housing. Uh, you'll notice a, a very sharp distinction appear on the map over here. And I'll flip back to this so you can see. These last remaining little flecks of, uh, of purple are the only places on Maui Island where uh, four units or more are permitted by right. And so you'll see that this is a very small proportion uh, under the law right now of the total available land. And much of it is in uh, resort areas like Kanapali, uh, which means that the housing that that's built in these areas, it'll be condos and timeshares primarily marketed uh, to, um, to vacationers and not necessarily to build the homes that local people need. So this is just one uh, example of what we can learn by uh, visualizing these laws. And I encourage you to explore the map more on your own time. I'll, I'll make a couple of final notes about what else, uh, what sort of research that having this data set enables. And so here are a couple of images from a study that we've done recently on Oahu. Uh, on the left, we have a neighborhood analysis. And what this allows us to do is match the zoning data up with parcels and with building footprints. So we can compare um, what, how much of the, uh, of the limits that the rules allow uh, is built out or is currently used by buildings today. And this allows uh, policymakers to understand where the zoning uh, as it exists today is actually tightly constraining uh, further, uh, further development of housing and uh, where there might be more room to grow and to understand why uh, some, some places, help them highlight places that haven't yet uh, developed according to the plan and understand why that is uh, to help us provide more housing. It also creates a compelling case uh, when necessary to show that if this area is, is already built up to the limits, then the only option to build this up any further, if that's a, if that's a policy goal, say for instance, with infill development in town, uh, is to change the rules to allow um, for, for more homes to be built. And then on the right-hand side, this is something that's my uh, one of my personal uh, gripes about zoning. This is an interaction analysis, which shows that in many cases, the laws uh, conflict with each other. So uh, on every uh, parcel, in Honolulu, there are two different rules governing uh, space. There is a height limit, uh, so there's you know you can only build so tall, and then there's a floor area ratio limit, which relates the size of the building to the size of the lot. What this shows is on uh, there's an inconsistency between the laws, where actually the height limit uh, forces buildings to be much smaller, even on large lots. Uh, than, than the rules would otherwise allow. So the, the rules on the books, they're, they're not only you know, stifling uh, growth in some important places, uh, but they're stifling it much more than, uh, than planners and policymakers are accounting for, and perhaps even they intend because of these bad interactions.
So looking ahead uh, to what's next for the Hawaii Zoning Atlas, uh, we will continue to update the map for transit-oriented development zoning as it comes through in Honolulu. Uh, we will watch closely any decisions made about disaster zoning in Maui, uh, and we will update it to reflect any bills that pass this session. So one more recap of what we talked about. The housing crisis is a policy choice. There are laws on the books that determine what can be built where. Uh, and those laws are excluding by design. They are part of a historical legacy of uh, intentional segregation that needs to change. And uh, all of you who are here today, I encourage you to be part of that solution. The Zoning Atlas will help to bring you and others like you the data they need uh, to win the fight for a better future. Thank you all. And with that, I will turn it over to Sterling. Awesome. Thank you, Trey. Uh, well, I mean, we could just stop there, right? Uh, Trey sort of laid it out in, in a compelling fashion. Uh, the origin of zoning is questionable and its effects today are certainly bad for housing affordability. So, you know, I want to thank Trey and the whole HCA team for creating this resource. And then also thank you to the National Zoning Atlas for supporting this work. And thanks to Diana for organizing this event. So my name is Sterling Higa and I serve as Executive Director of Housing Hawaii's Future, a nonprofit creating opportunities for Hawaii's next generation by ending the workforce housing shortage. And we were co-founded by young locals who were concerned that in the absence of major reform, we would continue to see uh, people leaving Hawaii, including our peers and now in this case, uh, as you can see, um, you know, my wife and I have four children, including little baby Rumi, and we worry that on Maui, where we live, without major reform, when our children are grown, they won't be able to live here, as so many children of Maui are realizing every day um, as they leave. So I want to talk first about social justice in Hawaii in particular. At this point, more than half of all Native Hawaiians live outside of the state of Hawaii, which is a, it's a statistic that really should give us cause for concern. It means that the Native people of this land, many of them are leaving because of the cost of living and housing being the chief contributor to that cost of living. Hawaii has the highest housing costs in the country, as Trey mentioned, and for decades, the housing costs here have grown significantly faster than wages. So the cost of housing is a big driver of that population exodus, at this point, it's eight consecutive years of population decline, and it doesn't appear to be slowing down. So what social justice means for me in Hawaii is true sustainability. And true sustainability means that our children and our grandchildren can afford to stay here. The August fires on the island of Maui where I live have made housing reform more necessary than ever. At this point, we need to build housing 3,000 homes for displaced families. And that 3,000 is added to a pre-existing deficit where for decades Maui had underbuilt housing relative to its population growth. And on top of that, we have labor shortages, the regulatory burdens and exclusionary zoning policies. With all of that, we need a paradigm shift in the way we think about housing construction to address the need. And resources like the Hawaii Zoning Atlas help give us the data and the information we need to understand the scope of the problem. Um, when you, after this talk, go and load up the Hawaii Zoning Atlas and you look at Maui and you look at the amount of land that's zoned for multifamily, um, you realize very quickly that there's not much of it. Um, and if we don't get serious about increasing density, increasing the land available for multifamily development, we're going to have either continuing sprawl or not enough housing production to meet demand. Now, Maui is an interesting case because Maui has, in my opinion, the worst zoning code in the state. This is not actually a controversial statement. So Maui's zoning code has not been updated with a comprehensive update since it was first adopted in 1960. Um, and it is essentially a 1950s era plan to build a sprawling car centric suburb. And unsurprisingly, that's what Maui has become in the last 60 years. If you drive out from the airport, it's indistinguishable from many California suburbs. It is impossible on Maui today to build a charming small town like Hana or Makawao or Paia. You couldn't build Wailuku or Lanai City. 
and you couldn't rebuild Lahaina. The, the parts of Lahaina that were great, the core that was historic, you could not rebuild that given current zoning. So to end sprawl and make housing affordable, Maui County has to have comprehensive zoning reform that allows mixed use, multifamily housing by right. And the reform is in progress. A few years ago, the county commissioned a consultant, Orion Planning and Design, to rewrite Title 19, the county zoning code. But then the pandemic happened, and then the fires, and the county, understandably, is losing focus. But it's incumbent on all of us to put pressure on um, this current administration and the county council to see the zoning reform through to the end. At this point, there's a single employee in the county of Maui whose responsibility it is to see the Title 19 zoning reform through. And that employee has other responsibilities. So this Title 19, right, zoning, is, as Trey said, the bedrock of land use decisions, the comprehensive reform that is at this point more than 50 years overdue on Maui relies on a single person who also has to do other stuff. Um, we're not prioritizing these important zoning reforms that will lead us to more housing. Okay, so Maui County aside, um, which I think Maui County definitely should look at the Hawaii Zoning Atlas to really think about comprehensive zoning reform, what's happening at the state level. Um, there are three interesting policies that I think uh, are being taken up this session and I think could each make a difference. And we're fortunate at this point to have legislative leadership in both the House and the Senate that really understand the housing issue and are motivated to make a difference. We also have a governor that has made housing the key priority of his administration. And so if ever there were a year where we could pass significant historic housing reform in Hawaii, this would be it. So what are some of the ideas? The first is legislation to make it easier to build starter homes. So given the limited supply of developable land in Hawaii, because we're on islands, uh, land costs are high. And minimum lot sizes increase the amount of land you have to buy to own a home. So by reducing minimum lot sizes, you reduce the barrier to entry to home ownership. Uh, alongside that are limits on the number of units that can be built on a lot. So right now in Maui County, for example, on any lot less than 7,500 square feet, you can only build one accessory dwelling unit. Um, why not two? Why not even three potentially? Um, if we want to move away from low density sprawl and we don't want to do, you know, like 40 story skyscrapers, we have to allow medium density. Small lots, uh, small homes on small lots is one way to do that. And the other way to do that is multiple homes on larger lots. Um, and Maui County and the state have to move toward that. So passing legislation that would enable starter homes would really help us move away from single family zoning away from low density toward medium density housing. The second big policy uh, option sort of opportunity is adaptive reuse. So Hawaii has a host of underutilized commercial property that could be redeveloped and uh, turned into housing. And sometimes this is high profile. So in Honolulu, uh, the urban core, certain commercial buildings, some floors and even entire buildings have been converted into apartments recently. Now this requires uh, adaptive reuse provisions, especially around mechanical ventilation or natural light. And we have to have a regulatory framework in place that allows for and even incentivizes this type of conversion because the alternative is just empty buildings. Um, besides that though, there are properties that have commercial uses where if you just add residential uses, you can arrive at mixed use that makes for a thriving community. Um, there's a huge opportunity on Maui. So the Queen Ka'ahumanu Shopping Center is right in the middle of Kapolui, um, which is a highly, it's a big residential area on Maui for those who are unfamiliar. Um, that shopping center is empty. I mean, vacancies are super high, including in the anchor tenant spots. Even on Black Friday, the parking lot is empty. You could add hundreds of units there and nobody would even notice and it's already developed. So adaptive reuse really means repurposing commercial buildings, but also thinking through how do we add residential uses to these uh, you know, formerly single use commercial zones to revitalize them and bring people back, especially into our urban and town course. The last thing is the yes in God's backyard bill. Uh, California passed SB4, which allowed faith institutions and nonprofit colleges to build affordable housing on their properties by right. 
I think this is a really exciting opportunity for Hawaii to, to take a serious look at it. It was proposed last session and deferred. I think we should take it up again and really discuss it. Um, there are a variety of organizations, including Kamehameha Schools, um, which was established by the late Bernice Powahi Bishop. And that school has as its mission the provision of education for Native Hawaiian children. And recently, the school has realized that in order to provide education, you have to make sure that children are surrounded by the supports they need, which include affordable housing. Kamehameha Schools also happens to be one of the largest uh, landowners in the state of Hawaii. And so there is a lot of land that they own. They have a need to provide affordable housing for Native Hawaiians. And there's a thicket of regulation that they have to go through in order to develop that housing. If you could make it easier for Kamehameha Schools or Catholic Charities or any of these other organizations that have serving the public as part of their mission, right? These are nonprofit institutions. Um, I think you'd have the potential to make rapid progress at building housing. And so it's something that we really have to explore earnestly and have a robust discussion about. Um, but these are just three things that are happening at the legislature this session. Um, I think the key is paying attention to the potential solutions, both at the county and the state level, and then being disciplined to follow up and to keep pressing. At Housing Hawaii's Future, we focus on building that public understanding of the challenges, right? And also the opportunities. What are What is the problem? What are the solutions? And that's where a resource like Hawaii Zoning Atlas becomes incredibly valuable for our organization. Because if you want to explain the impact of exclusionary zoning or single family zoning, I, I could say words, but a picture, uh, something that someone can, can interact with, it communicates it much more clearly and much more effectively. And so when we work with students or young professionals, allowing them to, to play with this tool and see how restrictive we are in terms of zoning, I think is going to help build public support for the kinds of reforms that will build more density and the kind of affordable housing that we need. So again, you know, happy to be here, excited for the Q&A and thanks to um, Trey and the team for designing this resource. Um, we're really grateful at Housing Hawaii's Future. And then thanks to the National Zoning Atlas for supporting this kind of work and also for elevating the conversation for smaller states like Hawaii. Thank you, Trey. And there's our contact information, Diana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, still on mute, Diana. Thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> um, so I'll start us off with the Q&A and please, I encourage everyone to ask questions. I think these were both really strong um, uh, presentations. So the first question I like to ask um, our teams that have completed their data sets is, is if there's anything you found that surprised you um, about zoning in Hawaii um, on that scale or through the process of making the Atlas, you kind of just reinforced things that you knew from the beginning. Yeah, I'll take this one. So uh, I think there have been surprises on uh, every in every county. Um, I knew something about zoning even before I got started, but to really dig into the rules uh, on each county and, and piece them together in this in this format uh, really shocked me in some cases. And so, you know, to quickly go through uh, the, the the Maui surprise is the one I already showed that uh, a lot of the land that in theory uh, is available to housing is in fact uh, high, high mountain ranges and uh, will not for practical purposes ever be used for any, anything at all. Uh, on uh, on Big Island in Hawaii County, um, it looks like, I mean, Hawaii County is enormous and it looks like there is an unbelievable amount of land available for housing um, until you unclick the largest minimum lot size and you realize that um, most of the land uh, on Hawaii County that's available for development at all uh, is these extremely large agricultural parcels where you could only build one home ever and uh, your minimum lot size uh, is, as, is as large as 100 acres. Uh, so that really caps uh, the, the total amount and commits us to uh, this, this sprawling um, 
version of development if we're, if we're going to build housing out there. And then uh, the, the last couple surprises, I'll be quick. In Honolulu, uh, we have invested an enormous amount in, in building uh, the rail down hugging the, the South Shore, uh, but the zoning has not caught up yet. And so uh, in many cases along the rail, uh, all you can build today is uh, is a single family home with an ADU or a, or a duplex. And uh, that would be just a, a tragic waste of resources if we allowed uh, that, that investment to go unused in that way. And then uh, in, in Kauai, I think uh, Kauai has some interesting and, and unique features, but most notably is that um, unlike the, the rest of the counties, um, their residential zoning measures uh, specifically in, in units per acre, whereas elsewhere we're doing the residential zoning calculations by lot sizes to, to establish density. And what that means is it's, it's very difficult, as um, Sterling and I are learning in, in consulting with some of the leaders of that community, to then go back and say, uh, well, no, actually, in certain cases, we would, we'd like to increase the density, uh, allow for more smaller homes, because the system is, is so rigidly set on um, only allowing a certain number of units per acre as a matter of law. Mm -hmm. Something that stood out to me in your presentation was that you described uh, suburbs um, in Hawaii uh, being indistinguishable from those from California. And, and that struck me, you know, on one hand, you know, our teams are looking at thousands of zoning codes across the country and no two are really alike, you know, they're so discreet, bespoke, you know, so, so uh, uh, specific, but when it comes down to this or when you haven't seen updates for a really long period of time, um, and the goal from the beginning was, as you said, sprawl, car dependency, large lot sizes, it does in the end, um, create an environment that is indistinguishable and and in Hawaii especially that's such a shame because uh, you know this is a state that obviously has a bunch of natural resources and and other assets to highlight that the zoning should from the beginning have been designed to do to do so um so my next question uh uh the Trey your presentation was definitely geared um toward to towards planners kind of as a call to action to planners um, so I just want to open up the scope a little bit um, and ask, how do you think the Zoning Atlas can be a tool for uh, for, for people who don't have a background uh, in in planning or, or for even people that um, aren't in the policy kind of sphere? Um, how do you how do you think that um, like the average person would both benefit and use uh, this atlas? Yeah, well, um... I'll I'll leave room for Sterling to answer this as well, since he is you know, leading an advocacy movement related to housing. Uh, but you know our our goal related to this is many people um, they, they don't realize that these laws are in effect. In fact, I didn't know that these laws existed until I went to planning school with, at you know in almost thirty, right? Which is a it's a, it's a wild time to find out that there are these invisible rules that are governing, you know, how far you have to drive in order to go to school or work or the hospital or whatever. Uh, so, you know, I think the initial goal is just to, to build awareness of these rules, what they do, and how they are decided, and uh, to help us recognize as a community that uh, they are decided in a way that does not make sense uh, for, for, the, the, for the public good. And uh, they are having very negative consequences on all of our lives, uh, whether we understand and participate or not. So uh, that's the baseline hope uh, for um, spreading this information more widely. And then uh, you know, moving one step up as, as people begin to understand this better, uh, they could potentially jump in and participate uh, through opportunities like those that, that Sterling has created with Housing Hawaii's Future. I have nothing more to add to Trey. I think he said it perfectly. Uh, resources like this make the invisible visible, and, and zoning codes are the definition of an invisible force that shaped the whole built environment. And for people who are not planners or working in development on Maui, for example, 
I say Title 19, that, those are just words, right? And the average person who isn't building housing on Maui doesn't think about Title 19. And yet, for the last 60 years, the development pattern of Maui has been dictated in large part by Title 19. So having a visual like this, I think it's, you know, it's the gateway drug of sorts where you experience it and you're like, whoa, there's this whole world. And now I'm more curious and I want to learn more. And the hope, as Trey said, is as you learn more, you start to realize you only need a few basic terms to start participating in the conversation. Most people, without that basic knowledge of what zoning is, how it works, without a few basic vocabulary terms, they don't feel confident to stand in the room with the planners. But in a, in a democracy, in a republic like ours, every person should be invested in these decisions about land use and planning um, because they're about the kind of world that we want for our children and grandchildren. So we want people to see the impact of policies so that they can take those policies into their own hands and reform them. And I was pleased to see that you reminded us kind of of like, what, what are our goals here on framing discussion with your, your brand new children that are coming into this world and, um, and again, like this, it was zoning, it, we realize the scale becomes really, you know, it's a long time, you know, the a decision made at some point, you know, kind of even haphazardly um, can have can have serious effects. And also the longer we wait not to change it, the longer these things, you know, it will, um, yeah, be difficult to, to realize in the future. So I will um, next ask, uh, some questions from the audience. So Erica asks, um, and we went over this a little bit, but we can repeat, uh, what key takeaways have you found so far through the mapping of Hawaii? And could you walk us through some of the strongest strongest opposing arguments for rezoning uh, for starter homes? So maybe we can start with this uh, the second part of that question. Yeah. Sterling, would you like to start on the Arguments? No, you shake your head. <laughs> no, I, I. So Trey, Trey has a, uh, Trey has thought through the the arguments opposing starter homes zoning, and, and he's got a lot of great things to say. Yeah. All right. I'll be happy to do that. Um, I hope that the earlier question answered um, the first part of this, the the key takeaways for the mapping of why. If not, uh, you can you can email me. I'd be happy to to talk more about this. Um, as far as the arguments. Uh, strongest arguments opposing rezoning uh, for starter homes. Um, one that comes up a, a good deal is uh, is infrastructure. Our infrastructure can't handle it, and uh, that is true in in some parts of of some islands. That you know the infrastructure was laid down for a specific number of homes and hookups, and um, and it's not we just can't add any more. Uh, but the starter homes bill. Um, doesn't get rid of that requirement, right? You still need to certify that there is enough infrastructure capacity to bear it. And um, in reality, because this isn't publicly available data, the infrastructure capacity, uh, people have been surprised to find uh, that, that there is a lot of capacity in some places. And it's because, um, you know, these are very old systems. And in some cases, they were built at a time when uh, housing, um, household sizes were much larger. And so, you know, for a wastewater system or for a water system, uh, what's important is not only how many people are around, but also how efficient uh, all, of the, um, all of the appliances are and uh, how, so how much water and, and wastewater you're actually using. And uh, we've made technology, you know, technological advances. We also have demographic changes that mean that the same systems that were, um, uh, you know, fully subscribed uh, 20 or 30 years ago uh, might have 10, 20, 30 percent capacity available today. So uh, that's that's one example. Um, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to think of more and, and talk more offline. I'll, I'll drop my email in, in the chat. I'd quickly ask, um, are these bills um, being faced with the same kind of resistance you see on the mainland as far as more traditional, quote unquote, NIMBY um, organization and those kinds of uh, motivations? I, I can take that. Um, 
I don't know that these bills necessarily face NIMBY opposition so much as they face legislators' fear of NIMBY opposition. Um, if, if you go to the hearings for a lot of these measures, only a few people actually show up. Now, of course, there are always people that call their, their senator or their representative and say, hey, you know, I, I don't like this. Um, but there's a lot of hesitancy among legislators, and, and I've heard this from some of them, right, that they are afraid that they will lose an election if they vote the wrong way on these sorts of things. Um, the truth is, in Hawaii, most elections are uncontested. And so the odds of legislators losing elections are very low. Um, so mostly it's it's not even like a NIMBY opposition that's rooted in any consequence for these elected officials. It's more this reflexive fear of like, oh no, like I don't want to step out and do this because what will my constituents think? And it's not every district. So um, districts vary in their distaste for this. There's a there's a somewhat irony about uh, some of these bills around density, where um, some of the people that fear density the most are are on the island that is the most densely and urbanly developed island, whereas other islands are more tolerant of medium density um, because they understand the the problem. So. I don't know that it's a, a not in my backyard opposition so much as it is a, a fear of an opposition that doesn't really exist. Now, every time a, a multifamily housing project is proposed in Hawaii, there are a few people who will show up and they'll say the typical concerns. Oh, this is going to add traffic or congestion or a burden on infrastructure to my neighborhood. I, I think it's not like other states in that um, the, the problem for a long time in Hawaii was there simply was no other voice on the other side. It, 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 Hawaii, uh, until our organization really was founded, did not really have an organization with a pro yimbi position, uh, like, a, like a we need additional supply. And now we have a YIMBY action affiliate, Hawaii YIMBY, which does great work in raising awareness of the problem. We've got this new resource, the Hawaii Zoning Atlas, and a variety of other organizations that are advocating for supply. So I think it's a perception rather than a, a reality of NIMBY opposition. Um, there will always be a few NIMBYs, but I don't think it's as bad here as it is in some other places. Um, a follow up with the last question from the chat, which is, uh, would any unit in Hawaii be expensive, just like in the Bay Area? Now, I'll, I'll take this. So, you know, the first thing I'll note is um, that we have some evidence uh, from the Bay Area of some of these policies that we're describing today making a difference. And so I just saw today a story out of San Diego. Uh, that a, the first YIGBY project, the Yes and God's Backyard project, has broken ground in San Diego. And even in spite of the very expensive um, environment we're in for financing, uh, that they are projected to build those units for $260,000 a piece, uh, which is very low uh, for, for that area and would be very low here as well, of course. Uh, so it's important to note that even in uh, you know, these places that we consider to be uh, very expensive areas, these problems are not intractable. We can make differences. 260,000 for a, a low income unit would seem like an enormous amount of money in you know, the middle of nowhere, Kansas or something, uh, but relative to the other options available in the Bay Area is, is quite affordable. So. As far as Hawaii goes, it, this is a good question, but any unit in Hawaii is expensive just in the Bay Area. I would highlight uh, the different components of costs that actually go into building a home. So you have land, materials, labor, and financing. And then you have pressure from global demand, right? Just people outbidding each other for it. So in Hawaii, land is extremely expensive. That's a function of the, of the global demand. And so uh, the bills that we've described today, the, the um, starter homes bill targets that aspect. It says, let's use less land for homes. Those homes will be less expensive by consuming less expensive land. Materials and labor in Hawaii, uh, we have a, you know, materials are always going to be a little more expensive than the mainland because we have to ship everything uh, across the ocean. 
um, labor is going to be more expensive in Hawaii because um, we have strong union protections out here. And uh, financing is about the same as anywhere. You know, we, we respond to the mortgage rates and the, the um, loan rates the same way that everywhere else does. So, um, the, sh so the short answer is ex relatively expensive as inexpensive relative to the mainland. Yes, probably any unit in Hawaii would be expensive relative to middle of nowhere in the mainland. However, um, that does not mean that we cannot make a difference on some of the largest input costs. And that's what these bills are, are trying to do. And if I could add one layer to that, one of the issues is there are very few housing units on the lower rungs of the housing ladder. So for someone who's renting now to move into a 1500 square foot single family home that's selling for a million dollars and purchase that is impossible. You cannot make that leap from renting to buying a million dollar home. But if you were able to purchase a small home on a small lot for $400,000, $500,000, now you're talking about being able for a family to build equity, to have a home that they own, and then use that to move up the housing ladder. So starter homes are about creating an entirely new class of housing in Hawaii at a price point that more families, young families, uh, our aging kupuna or our elders um, can afford, where right now there's a whole segment of the population that would like to own something, um, but there's no product there for them at all. And I'll just add one grace note to that related to our out-migration challenges, which is when you can't make that jump here, Right when there are no starter homes to to start climbing up the ladder here, then you are forced to leave, climb the rung somewhere else, and then hopefully one day move back and keep climbing. Right, and so a big issue with our housing dynamics is this this problem of people leave. Uh, you know, they they imagine in their heads that they're going to buy a home, build equity, save up, move back, uh, and then life happens. And then, you know, their kids are going to high school and then they're going to college on the mainland. But then, okay, well, now we've paid off our home. Or, and so it, it doesn't happen like that in, in real life. And it's a major um, drain on us demographically and economically to not have local options available for local families. Uh, we have two minutes left, and so maybe I can fit in one final question. So getting a little bit back to the zoning code, um, I, want is, I, I wanted to ask kind of more generally about um, zoning code literacy among Hawaiians. And again, try if this is something you're you're encountering kind of like later in the middle of your career. You know, like I'm just wondering um, if you, when you're um, at city halls, um, or even talking with other advocates, um, other other housing developers, how would you rate kind of the general uh, again zoning um, literacy, and uh, what would you want um, to leave everyone with? You know, as far as the few main points to 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 know most about uh, Hawaii's Hawaii zoning code. Yeah, uh, zoning is an arcane topic everywhere, and it's really only in the past couple of years with the housing crisis that it has become. Uh, a topic of conversation, a topic that's reported on uh, by the media. But, um, you know, locally connected people have known the value of zoning for a long time. And this is where uh, a lot of the kind of nasty underside of our politics appear, right? The sort of pay for play, making deals, that sort of thing. Um, we in, in Hawaii had, uh, had an embarrassing uh, bribery scandal uh, a couple of years ago in Honolulu because uh, planners were, were taking money in order to fast track building permits. Um, and so, you know, these things are important. People are willing to pay a lot of money for, for slight changes and uh, the public ignores them to, to their detriment. I'll, um, I'll share one kind of scary story about this, which is, um, these, these kinds of decisions take place on long cycles. So general plans, which kind of decide how much people are going, how many people are going to plan for and where we're going to 
with the with the growth and everything operate on a 20 to 30 year cycle uh, zoning regulations ideally are at least reconsidered every 15 or 20 years but in practice as sterling mentioned uh, out here it's been more like 40 or 50. Uh, so these are decisions that are made decades uh, ago that are that are still affecting us today and um, scarily, we're not made on the um, advice of that many people to begin with. So I was reading a book recently uh, talking about uh, the rebuilding of, of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And they talked about how there was this, you know, design charrette, this sort of typical urban planner, let's go see what the community thinks about what the future of the neighborhood should be, kind of a meeting. And 13 people showed up. And those 13 people, that was considered to be a very good turnout in a neighborhood of eight or 10,000, 13 people. And those people sat around a table and they talked with the planners about what they would like to see in their neighborhood and what they would like their neighborhood to become. And that conversation is what informed the plan. Those 13 people in that room defined how that neighborhood would rebuild from Hurricane Katrina and set down its pattern for the next 20 to 30 years. So uh, in Hawaii right now, we have the state bills, which we've talked about. Uh, Bill 64 is up for consideration at, at the city and county of Honolulu. That is a massive overhaul of the land use ordinance. I don't know the bill number, but I know that it's also up for consideration in Maui right now. And on Big Island, both the general plan and the land use ordinance are being discussed right now. There are opportunities to go out and comment publicly on these issues. And Kauai will soon see a, a starter homes bill introduced. So wherever you live in Hawaii, there is an opportunity for you to get involved. And if you align at all with anything we've said today, I can guarantee that you are an invaluable voice in those conversations and that your perspective, if you do not go, will likely not be represented in those meetings because so few people know about zoning, are literate in zoning, and care enough to attend. Well, Sterling, unless you have something to add, I think that's a really good place to end the call to action. I'll keep it short. Um, you know, thanks to people like Trey jumping in, the movement is growing, we're making progress, and we will win. Um, because if you rewind back to the pictures of our children and our imagined grandchildren, if we don't win, they won't be able to stay. So we have to achieve affordable housing for all in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you both. Trey, last uh, words. I, I have one last word, which is uh, join us in Kauai. If you, uh, if you happen to live on Kauai and, and care about these issues, we will be there in Lupue this Saturday at the Ulu Room starting at 4 p.m. as part of the uh, Crest Street Night Market. So uh, please come out, meet some uh, local uh, housing advocates and learn more about the opportunities. We'll also be speaking uh, to the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce, I believe, next month uh, about uh, changes on Big Island and how you can get involved there. So please stay tuned for that. Okay, now I can thank you both. Thanks for the great uh, presentations and conversation. And people have um, your contact info if you want to continue this conversation online. And thank you to everybody um, for joining this uh, State Zoning Atlas Reveal for Hawaii. So we'll end it here. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone.